Hey everyone, this is Lisa and Nancy, and today we are sitting out looking over the Red River. We are in Natchitoches, Louisiana, and we are at the Grand Grand Accor Visitor Center, and we're sitting with our friends from the Cane River National Heritage Area. We've got Rebecca and Logan. Logan is our tour guide for the downtown tour, the historical tour that he took us through the Natchitoches Historic District. We've also got Kelly here from the Natchitoches Visitor Bureau, and Rebecca, you run the Cane River Heritage Area, and uh, you've been on shows with us before, so yes. it's good to meet you in person. Yes, it is. It's been a pleasure meeting you guys, and it's a pleasure again to be back and be talking with you. Yeah, and be back here in Natchitoches, okay. and now we leave tomorrow, and I know. Where? <laughs> <laughs> where? 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 Oh, uh, you know, I, I wanted to touch on the Cane River Heritage Area, and then we'll talk about where we are, and but it, it's a heritage area and how big it is because this spans like pretty much all of Natchitoches, right? And then like Isle of Breville and... Correct. So the heritage area is about 116,000 acres. It is. It includes the city wow. of Natchitoches. It includes the the historic Cane River um, community. It's about a 32 mile um, area, square mile area that includes the Down River plantations and the Albreville community, which is our Cane River Creole community. Um, it also extends out west on the El Camino Real de los Tejas, which is our Spanish influence, and it includes Los Adias State Historic Site and Fort Jessup State Historic Site. So we're we're one of the smaller hmm. national heritage areas in the country, but we have we make up for it with a lot of really wonderful attractions and historic sites and a real robust living culture. And being a heritage area, that's a really unique thing because you know right now uh, we're we're sitting at an, an uh, is it the U.S. It's, it's the, U, uh, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. Army Corps of Engineers. Mm -hmm. See, that's a different kind of park management, it right? Is. We have the National Park Service State. We've got all these different regional kinds of parks, BLM land. Um, but the National Heritage Area is a makeup of community and park service and different park services come together, right? Absolutely. So the 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 idea of National Heritage Areas is an idea to a new way of looking at the national park system. Um, it's a, it was a way, it was established in the 1980s as a way for the National Park Service and the Department of Interior to sort of not own so much federal land but allow local leadership and the grassroots effort towards preservation mm -hmm. and uh, cultural conservation. Mm -hmm. So it's a partnership and everything that we do begins with partnerships. But um, at the highest level it's a partnership between the local management entity for our in, in our case we're a local not for profit and the National Park Service. Mm -hmm. And they um, they give us our federal appropriations and we work with the National Park Service and adhere to the Secretary of Interior your standards for preservation and conservation. Hmm. So do you go and ask to be a heritage area? Yes, you uh, do. And you have to be, uh, each heritage area is created by its own piece of legislation and it's enacted by Congress, the U.S. Congress. So it's a big deal. We are nationally significant. The national heritage areas are created because they are places that tell pieces of the American story, not mm -hmm. just the local story, but they are a part mm -hmm. of the fabric of what tells our national um, history. Mm -hmm. So they are they are created by Congress, and only Congress can create a national heritage area. Oh. That, that's what we talk about, like mm -hmm. with Yuma, where mm -hmm. we, you know, our headquarters is out there, uh, the Yuma Crossing National Heritage Area. What's so fascinating about that is where people had to cross the Colorado River uh, for the gold rush, uh, the Spanish, you know, we're going back to the Spanish, mm -hmm. like you have the Spanish history here too, um, but it really shaped part of the Southwest and California, uh, the history that was just in this one crossing at the river, mm -hmm. at the Colorado River. Uh, so it's not just local history. It shaped um, history for the entire country. And I think that's the same as the Natchitoches Correct. in this region. Correct. Um, it's so, I mean, because it's the oldest settlement. So we that's are. Part of it. We're the oldest permanent settlement in the Louisiana Purchase Territory. We were founded in 1714. And we were older than our, our sister city, New Orleans, um, by four years. And we are really, if you if you go back over 300 years, you're looking at a frontier landscape, and you're at the edge of two colonial empires. Mm -hmm. You have the French who established Fort Saint Jean Baptiste in 1714, and then you have the Spanish who come along and they're trying to protect their western expansion and what is now Western United States, and they establish Los Adias. Mm 
mm. mission and uh, later on the fort. And so we have these two colonial empires stuck in the middle of nowhere and mm. they are dependent upon each other, mm. the land and the river. They're forbidden to trade with each other, but if they don't, they won't survive. Mm. So we like to say that, you know, you're historically, these folks survived because they depended on the land, the river, and each other to make a way of life. And what's so significant and why we are a heritage area is because you can still see that today. Mm. Our people still depend on the land, the river, and each other to make a way of life that is better for for their families. Mm. And also, Logan, um, you took us on an amazing tour this morning, so thank you for that, and I want to touch on those. Um, but you, you led to this on the tour. You talked about what happened here at Grand Decor, um, and we're looking over at the Red River, so uh, the history is also goes into the Civil War, right? Yes, ma'am. So Grand Decor um, is originally settled by Native Americans, later settled by uh, the French, because it's obviously a gorgeous view. Um, and later used by Confederate soldiers to prepare for the Red River Campaign of April of 1864. Mm -hmm. um, the Confederates are preparing to put guns to stop the Union from advancing all the way to Shreveport, uh, which is the state capital at the time, and they leave. Um, mm -hmm. They don't defend this position uh, because they don't actually have the cannons to defend themselves. So they retreat to Mansfield, Louisiana, which is about halfway between here and Shreveport, 30 miles north. Um, and for some reason, the Union gives chase and they go to Mansfield, and that's the last major Confederate victory of the Civil War. Wow. Um, the Union returns back to Grand Decor, because this is their supply depot, 80-foot um, bluff, pretty easy to see if anybody's mm -hmm. going to attack you. So they sit here for about two weeks, and then they realize we need to get out of, out of North Louisiana. We don't have any, any extra troops. We don't have any extra food. We need to make it back to Baton Rouge before things run out. Mm -hmm. um, that's when they try to go through Natchitoches, and for some reason or another, there's six Confederate soldiers there that take a few shots at some, some scaredy cats that are from the Union, um, and rather than fire back, they return back to General Nathaniel Banks, the commanding officer, and tell him there's a massive army stationed in Natchitoches, and they can't go through downtown, so they need to go around. Um, so they build pontoon bridges um, right out in front of us here, where they evacuate to the eastern bank, and they come down the eastern side of the Red River, kind of avoiding the massive army in Natchitoches, um, and making it all the way back to Baton Rouge. You know, um, you're going to start that war all over. <laughs> uh, it'll be okay. I think everyone's, everyone's grown past that. <laughs> so this is really iconic that we're sitting here and also um, important because it's, again, through partnerships, like you were saying, that we wouldn't be sitting here right now if it wasn't for the partnerships Absolutely. that you developed here. Partnerships, um, as I said, are really the foundation, the cornerstone mm -hmm. of everything that we do, and Grand Corps is a, is a great example. Mm -hmm. In 2016, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers took a budget cut, mm -hmm. and visitor centers like these were not able to be uh, staffed. Mm -hmm. And so the Heritage Area stepped in and said, well, we can help you out. We can use some of our volunteers and some of our staff to keep the hours mm -hmm. open and so that we can keep visitors coming to visit this wonderful attraction mm -hmm. um, that really talks about the history and the landscape of our area mm. and um, through that we've also created programming and we've created this really great lecture series it started with probably about a handful of people on a Saturday morning showing up and now we have about a regular uh, attendance of about 60 people who, who show up uh, routinely mm. to learn a little bit more about what this history's culture and history are all about mm. um, and it's really exciting because we are seeing a resurgence of people in our local area becoming more invested in our history and our culture. They want to find out that information. That's what I was going to say about the um, locals being here and being part of it. Um, then it gets them also involved in um, the tourism, I think, as right. well, for understanding um, the importance of interpreting and preserving history. Absolutely. I mean, if, if it was our job to go out and really bear the torch for preservation and cultural conservation, it would be a difficult task. We are the the great bring, bringer together, mm -hmm. the communer, but we have a community who is invested in preservation, 
not only bricks and mortar preservation, but in cultural conservation. So they are recording their histories. They're, mm -hmm. you know, bringing those photos to our museums and saying you should have this. I mean, they, they, we have a community that is very passionate about our history and our culture and the diversity mm -hmm. of our history and culture. Because I think that's one of the most significant things about us is that we are a diverse culture from the very beginning, mm -hmm. from our, our origins. We've been a diverse culture and we've been a community that while nationally there's been there's been ebbs and flows, we've always recognized that our diversity is sort of what brings us together. Yeah, your diversity is your strength. And I think this is really important for the health of, of Natchitoches from an economic boost through tourism. And you know, it's great when you have something educational that brings people to spend money in town. Absolutely. You know, it's it's a great partnership. Absolutely. It, you know, if you had visited in the Natchitoches in the 1980s, in the early 90s, uh, Front Street was pretty pretty dead. There were there were closed storefronts. There were empty storefronts. Um, we had um, some plantations downriver that were sort of open uh, to the public. They'd do little B and B tours and things like that. But it's really this this seed money, we like to say it's seed money, it's a little bit of investment, this federal investment through the Heritage Area Program that has been able to sort of get the ball rolling and really making Natchitoches a true heritage tourism mm -hmm. destination. We partner all the time with our CVB partners. Mm -hmm. they, um, they're they one of our premier partners. I was going to say that we've got to talk about partnership. This is like amazing. Uh, yes. I mean, we we work very closely with Arlene and Kelly mm -hmm. and the Natchitoches uh, Commission and Visitors Bureau. Bureau. They um, Everything that we do has to have that, that tourism perspective. Um, if we're going to build it, then we know that they're going to come and we have to be able to um, preserve those, mm -hmm. those structures or those stories, mm -hmm. but also sort of tell that story to the public. Mm -hmm. um, Kelly, you know, this is really cool with Logan coming and doing those tours. They're free tours. This mm -hmm. is important. Um, you know, so people come up. Is it Wednesday through... Tuesday through Saturday, 9.30 through in the morning. 9.30 in the, the morning, and they come right up at the Visitor Bureau. Yes, yes, and they do change, the hours change by season, so oh, okay. I, I do encourage you if you're wanting to do that, look at our website. We update it on our website, or you can look, or you can call us and ask, hey, when are the tours, mm -hmm. you know, for the dates that you're coming. Um, but yeah, so they meet right in front of our office, so you can grab a cup of water, you can use the re you know, restrooms are right there beside our office, and, um, and then go on the tour. It's a, it's a nice 45 minute tour. Um, you learn very brief and, you know, but a good general overview of Natchitoches and how it began and why it is the way that it is. Um, and like we were saying this morning, you know, you do that and then you, you figure out, oh, I want to hear more about this area or this area. That's it's right good, there. You end at the visitor center so you can, yeah. you can say, okay, where do I go to learn about more about mm -hmm. this, this, and this? And that's where we send it. Um, mm -hmm. And there again, another just great partnership because it is a free opportunity for visitors um, to really get invested in the community and in um, seeing what Natchitoches and tourism is all about and kind of getting a glimpse of things they may not, you know, may not have taken a look at right. um, without going on that tour. And it gives you the history of Louisiana too. And yeah. really, the the country. I mean, I didn't know Zebulon Pike got involved. I mean, come mm -hmm. on, I had no idea he was part of the no no man's land and all of Absolutely. that. So, um, right now we're celebrating no man's land. That's a, a tricentennial of uh, bicentennial. Okay. Uh, three years. Yeah, we're doing three years of celebration. Yeah. yeah celebrating no man's land at the neutral strip of the area when there was no law and order. No law. And there was privateers and buccaneers. That's and right. And, and, and outlaws. And and outlaws. And it's so cool. <laughs> 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 so it's, it's this whole region is celebrating all the different events. Um, I know Sabine Parish and Vernon Parish as well. Um, mm -hmm. But I also wanted to touch on you celebrating 25 years of the Cane River National Heritage Area this year. And it's the same for Cane, Cane River Creole National Historical Park? Absolutely. So we... Um, we're actually unique. We're the only national heritage area and national park to be um, created in the same enabling legislation, which makes us unique across oh. the heritage area program system. But in 1994, we were um, we were created both the Cane River National Heritage Area and the Cane River Creole National Historical Park. Mm -hmm. The park is is made up of Oakland and Magnolia plantations, and they really focus on telling the whole story from the, the beginning of the planter, the plantation 
society and creating um, plantations on in the new world to mechanization mm -hmm. and sharecropping and tenant farming. They tell the, the whole story, mm -hmm. um, which is really fascinating because you don't get that um, in very many places. We also like to say that our our plantation story here is a little bit different. We're not the grand plantations that you see on the Mississippi River near New Orleans or in Georgia. Our our plantations are farms. Mm -hmm. They were working farms out on the uh, out on the frontier. You know, they, they did a lot of subsistence farming. They did do they did raise um, cotton and tobacco and indigo in the early years, um, but the park tells that story, that mm -hmm. Creole story of um, making a life in the colonial frontier um, and then taking it on to the mechanization era. Um, and we, as the heritage area, are the big umbrella. Mm -hmm. And we, we are working, we work with the community and we try to not only preserve um, the, the, the architecture, the culture, but we also try to promote that to increase mm -hmm. economic development through heritage tourism. That's awesome. That's awesome. I remember the first time we came here, Mm -hmm. And we went, the first thing we did was go to Cane River uh, Creole National Park, mm -hmm. Central Park, and we went to Open Plantation, and uh, then we went and got something to eat, I think, at the gas station down the road. Oh, yeah. And yeah. then we went mm -hmm. to Magnolia Plantation, mm -hmm. and we ended up talking with them and film. It's actually, if you look at our, our video on Cane River uh, Creole National Historical Park at the end, you'll see a gentleman who works there. Or, and I know he was he yeah. was somewhere in council, a councilman or something. Yeah. Uh -huh. And so we were like, well, what you know, what has this done for you? Um, and it was five years ago because it was 20 years old. I remember now. <laughs> it was five years ago that we were here. Um, and what how's uh, the park and the heritage area helped you as a business? And he said it was it's like nine day difference. The more people come to the gas station, buy food, get things. And so it's been very, very, um, it, just a, a good thing, not just for his business, for the town. And he just, you know, big, big plus because he said it really helps their business stay afloat. Yeah. And especially when you go out there, there's not that many houses and stuff out there. No, it's very you know. rural. It's and rural, yeah. The agricultural lands and um, our local our local businesses depend on on the heritage tourism, mm -hmm. and um, we can see we can mark a considerable difference from mm -hmm. the time the heritage area was created before the heritage area was created to when we first received our first. Uh, appropriations of federal mm -hmm. monies, and we started to work with the community. Mm -hmm. um, it really does add a, that little investment, that federal mm -hmm. investment mm -hmm. that we would need to really support preservation and heritage. I, I think it's so good that people know about that, you mm -hmm. know, because when you hear the word tourism, a lot of times you think mm -hmm. Disneyland's coming to town, and that's <laughs> not it. Nancy not and I are here, and that's kind of like that. No, <laughs> Priscilla the sock monkey, but uh, yeah. but no, but it's it's something that um, I think it's really important for kids to get involved in. Exactly. Uh, do you have events coming up to um, celebrate absolutely. your 20, being 25 years old? Absolutely, <laughs> we do. So we kick off our, our 25 year celebration in August with our park partner. But we are planning um, a big birthday celebration on October 26th. It's the Saturday before Halloween, and it's our Cane River Fall Fest. Mm. And it's really geared towards families and, and kids. Um, we will have a birthday cake. We'll sing happy birthday. Yay. We're working on getting Buddy the Bison here from the National Park to, co to come and, and shake hands and meet with the kids. Um, but we will have demonstrations and a lot of cultural um crafts and demonstrations from local um, folk artists and things like that from around the region. Mm -hmm. um, this is our second year doing this festival and we're really proud of it. It's part of a series that we're, we've created an initiative, you know, in 2016 the National Park celebrated its 100th mm -hmm. birthday and we're looking at the next 100 years and how to get people invested, how to get our citizens across the country invested in the National Park Service and your national heritage areas. And that's really through the younger generation mm -hmm. and creating stewards for the mm -hmm. next generation. So we we identified that and we said, how can we connect with mm -hmm. our local stewards, that younger generation, and how can we get them involved in the park and let them know that you have these gems, these true national gems in your backyard. And that's through the Cane River Fall Fest and we also have a spring festival called the Find Your Park Festival. And that's geared towards we actually invite all of our federal and state partners who manage different park sites mm -hmm. or, or wildlife refuges, and we ask them all to come to Oakland Plantation, and we have crafts, and we have information sessions, and we have games, and a petting zoo, and it really sort of just gets 
local and regional audiences to say, hey, we have a national park in North Louisiana, and, yeah. and you know, yeah. we should go visit it. And yeah, there are fun things to do. Yes, I yeah. think you're the only one that's really a national park yes. service. Yeah. yeah, and then it also, I think, for for the children, makes history come alive, mm -hmm. and I'm sure their grades are going to be better yeah. mm -hmm. from a visit here. I mean, history is really difficult to learn through textbooks. And for kids. Exactly. And, well, and this is like, wow. It's the tangible. It's yeah. really making, like you said, it's mm -hmm. making history come alive. They yeah. can touch it. They can see it. Yeah. You know, I have a five-year-old, and when I thought about Find Your Park Festival the first time, I thought about taking, she was then three, taking her to a plantation sounded like a nightmare, actually, because mm -hmm. I thought I'd spend an hour and a half saying, don't touch that, don't touch yeah. that, don't touch mm -hmm. that, and I wanted to create an experience that moms like me, dads like me, you know, mm -hmm. grandparents like me who have these younger kids, they want to get them invested in mm -hmm. their history, but they want it to in, a, in a consumable way that their kids can fun have way. fun. It's fun, but they're learning something mm -hmm. at the same time. Love it, love it. The website is canerivernha.org. Yes, ma'am. And then everyone, Natchitoches.com is the website to go to for this whole region, and that is N-A-T-C-H-I-T-O-C-H-E-S.com. <laughs> so it's Natchitoches is what it sounds like, or looks like, but it's Natchitoches is how it's pronounced. Mm -hmm. So thank you all so much. Thank you. Thank you for taking yeah, us on our tour today, and thank you, Kelly, for being our tour guide, and Rebecca, again, thanks for joining us. Thank you.